Father, thank you for this time that we have here tonight. We're gathered in your name. And through our worship, we've glorified you. And we trust now through our time together sharing, we will glorify you. Um, Lord, we, we pray for understanding and wisdom. And uh, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so we commit this conversation to you, Lord. Uh, help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive what you would say to us tonight. And we thank you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. So this is Zechariah chapter two. This is actually often quoted, but I think sometimes out of, out of context. So this is, this is Zechariah saying, for thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. And then this is the part that is often quoted, for he who touches you, touches the apple of his eye, God's eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them and they shall become spoil for their servants. And then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. So the idea of he who touches you, touches the apple of his eye, it, it can literally mean whoever messes with Israel pokes a finger in God's eye. The apple of his eye, like the pupil, like you don't, you don't mess with Israel. You know those bumper stickers, don't mess with Texas? It should say don't mess with Israel. Because when you mess with Israel, he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. You're messing, if you mess with Israel, you're, it's like you're poking a finger in God's eye. And that's why he says, for surely I will shake my hand against them. Hamas has poked a finger in God's eye. Absolutely. Because they have come against Israel with this terrorist attack, October the 7th. Go back, um, Amir, and talk about that day. And, um, and you've been even sharing it to members of Congress. Yes. Like, tell us your heart about what's happening in Israel right, right now. Well, we're a nation that is uh, in a post-trauma right now. Um, on October 7th, it was Saturday. Shabbat, it was the last day of the longest and the happiest holiday in the Jewish calendar, which is Sukkot Tabernacles. It is the day where we mark the uh, end of the reading of the Torah cycle. It is the day where we're supposed to celebrate and dance in the streets. And, and really, it, it, it's, it's the happiest of all. And that morning at 5 a.m., the uh, Hamas terrorists thought that it's another uh, exercise. They didn't even, no one knew that this is the day besides the very few commanders. They went to their morning prayer, gathered together, and then their commanders told them that which we've been practicing over and over on, today is the real thing. They were divided to groups. They were given the manuals as, as of what to do, where to do, how to do. Something they've been talking about and practicing over and over again. They were told in details what has to be done and who's supposed to command these things. And at 6.29 a.m., they began under the barrage of rockets and mortar shells, they began a, a major invasion through the fence, first by flying drones that will drop bombs on top of the IDF outposts, and then snipers would completely um, defuse the cameras um, along the border, and once we were blind to see what's going on. They managed to break 15 different places. They breached 15 times in different, along the border uh, the and in, exactly along the fence, very two and a half billion dollar fence. Yeah. And then all the way into Israel. And within the next three hours, they performed one of the most barbaric massacre in the history of planet Earth. Now, we only now begin to understand what happened because right now, people who survived start to talk. 
for, uh, for the longest time, for eight, nine weeks, many of them attempted suicide and many of them were admitted to mental hospitals because of what they have seen and what they witnessed. We have, I don't even, even have words to describe what happened. Um, but I will tell you that the sheer sadistic um, uh, torture that preceded the actual shot in the head was something we've never seen before. Women were raped by the hundreds. Some of them were shot and killed during the rape. Some of them were shot after, and some of them were shot before and then raped. We're talking about males that were raped. We're talking about women that their pelvises were completely broken. We're talking about heads of people rolling around without bodies because they chopped heads like crazy. Genitalia of male genitalia were chopped off everywhere. We're talking about people that were burned alive. We're talking about a baby that was baked in an oven. Alive. Alive. We're talking about a woman that is pregnant. Her stomach was open and her baby inside was stabbed. And then she was shot. We're talking about families that were tortured to death by chopping the breast of the woman, chopping, gouging the eye of the man, chopping the feet of the girl and the hand of the boy, and they bled to death for hours. We're talking about things that we've never even seen in the Holocaust or have seen performed by ISIS. And what happened is that um, the first responders came and then, Israel, I mean, we were completely in shock. Of course, there was a major, major colossal failure of the Israeli intelligence. We actually alerted the highest ranks in the intelligence. They did not want to believe that it's going to happen and they did nothing to stop it. So it was an intelligence failure. Absolutely, 100%, and the intelligence admit that also. Mm -hmm. In fact, six months ago, we were sure that something like that might happen during Passover. And there was a high alert in Israel, and the terrorists changed their mind. Because they changed their mind, we thought it was a, re a false alarm. Yeah. So they waited for another holiday. Now, I, I published an article six months ago, that, actually more now, it's seven months ago, in April, where I said that the grand plan of the Iranians, which they've been working on for the longest time, for, for years, that was the job of Qasem Soleimani, which you guys eliminated a few years ago. His job was to create proxies all around Israel, in Syria, in Iran, in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Gaza, in Yemen, and eventually when the day comes on command, simultaneously, all of them will do what Hamas did, simultaneously. You can imagine the, multi, the, the magnitude of having that done from Gaza, from Lebanon, from Syria, from the West Bank, and from Yemen, by hundreds of rockets at the same time. That was the grand plan. Hamas jumped the gun too fast. And by doing that, he may have killed 1,400 people that day, but we are now ready to destroy them, push Hezbollah 40 kilometers north, and de deal with the others. He basically destroyed the element of surprise that the Iranians had planned for something much bigger. And because you got the Israelis, you all recovered large amounts of munition that these initial terrorists had taken into Israel. 
and the, at the various kibbutzim, they were, they, you guys recovered a bunch of their arsenal that they left because they were there for a long, they were planning a long-term stay. Exactly. They were planning on weeks, if not months. Yeah. They were planning on invading into large military bases and big cities like Ashdod, Ashkelon, and others. What they brought with them could have easily killed anything between 50 to 100,000 people. Yeah. The reason I'm saying that is that I choose to look at the miraculous side right. of that day right. just exactly as I looked at 9-11 when I was here when it happened. And if you only knew what was originally planned versus what really happened, you know that probably only 5% of, of what they had hoped uh, to kill of the, the people they hoped were actually killed. So, I mean, God was there to really restrain and protect in ways mm. that we will only understand yeah. in years to come. Yeah. But um, I see a lot of amazing things that are happening as a result of all of yeah. this. But right now we live in a nightmare of the abductees in, in Gaza because only a few days ago we, they began to release them. And only a few days ago we began to hear from them what was it or how was it there. And the horrific stories that we're hearing now are confirming to us the worst that we thought. Adding to that, finally people who were in a state of shock yeah. until now begin to talk. So we're eight weeks, nine weeks into this whole thing, and only now we begin to understand what really happened and what is going on right now in Gaza. So you and the Israelis have documented all of this, the brutality of what Amir shared. I mean, and it's even worse than, as bad as that was that you shared, the description, it's even, it's even worse. Um, and it's hard to even hear that brutality. But what is so troubling is what's your opinion about, you have a lot of these college campuses here in the United States, and a lot of times when they're interviewed on the street, they're like, oh, that's propaganda, that's Israeli propaganda. That stuff never really happened. What are you feeling about it? I feel sad for the parents that pay so much money to get such yeah, a stupid- Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's that's all. stinking education. Yeah. Um, look, this is the most documented massacre in the history yeah, of planet yeah. Earth because they documented it as, the, it, yeah, as they it happened. It. They documented it themselves. Come it off. was live on yeah. Telegram, on Instagram, on Facebook, yeah. and on their GoPros, live. I mean, they did it. And yeah. so they were proud of it. There were Telegram channels that now have been blocked by YouTube and Apple, uh, excuse me, Google and Apple because of the content that was yeah. there. So, I mean, and, and, and by the way, uh, they have said that they would do it over and over again and again if they could. So they, they admit yeah. that they did it. But people around the world choose to believe the lie. Yeah. Because the lie is easier to, to deal with rather than the truth. Yeah, they don't want to be distracted by facts. Um, what is your opinion, Amir? This is kind of a fine line with the, the government trying to secure the hostages and get them back. But this ceasefire is allowing Hamas to regroup and part of the agreement to get the Israeli hostages back is to bring humanitarian aid, including gasoline, which is going to do nothing except empower their ability to fire back. So what's your thoughts? Because that's got to be obviously we want the hostages to come back. But at the same time, it's such a difficult thing. We're, we're allowing Hamas to regroup. What's your thinking on all that? I was one of those that opposed this deal, not because I don't want them to come back. I actually, because I want them to come back, I thought it was early, too early. I thought we need to completely destroy the northern part of Gaza, eliminate or take all possibilities of Hamas to recover in that area, and when they feel with their back to the wall in the southern part of Gaza, then they would have released more for less. And because what do we get now? We get the abductees back home and we are releasing terrorists back yeah. in the street. Yeah. That's what we do. We get innocent babies, innocent older women, and we release terrorists back in the street. So this is not exactly a great deal, huh? Yeah. But the thing is, um, I believe that a, a 
brutal, sadistic uh, 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 terror organization like Hamas will, can only understand pressure. And, and when they think that they do well and they call the shots, they toughen their position. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see now. Look, one of the f most famous pictures in this whole October 7 thing is uh, the mother and the, n it, then it was a nine months old red hair baby and her three year old red hair baby. And she was taken, the father was also taken, and they realized the Israelis really want them back because that's the youngest uh, baby th that was taken. So they just announced today that they were killed. Mm. Now the thing is, they already before announced others that were killed and then they released them and we found out that they're alive. But this is their way to play with our emotions and this mm -hmm. is their way to destroy our, because we, are a, we love life, we don't love death. We don't sanctify death. I mean, Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, here I put before you death, and life, choose life. Life is our choice, not death. We, we don't go and kill people and kill ourselves in order to win life somewhere. No, they know how much we, we love life. Mm -hmm. They know how much we are willing to pay for our children and women to come back alive. And they're playing with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm telling you, if we would have pushed them all the way with their back to the wall and said, First thing before we even talk, give us the baby. They would have done that. Mm -hmm. Right now, we already started it. They already see that they're doing well. They got gasoline, they got, by the way, every drop of gasoline goes to operate their ventilation system. For the tunnels. For the tunnels. They, mm -hmm. live, under the, they live seven, eight stories under the ground. Yeah. And they have, you know, 300 miles long tunnels. We're talking about uh, assist this Gaza is the largest terror base on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Every school, every hospital, every clinic, every playground, every United Nations installation is a building that covers a shaft that leads to a command center under the ground. Every mosque is a place where they either hide weapon or they operate the weapon from. Mm -hmm. So, this is what we have to deal with. Yeah, because as soon as you bomb them, then they're like, oh, you're, you're killing innocent civilians in hospitals and schools and clinics and all this stuff. And it, it's like a no win for Israel. Not only that, they abducted people that were released yesterday. You know what we just discovered? One of them was held in the attic of a house of a United Nations worker. Yeah. And the other one was held in the house of a doctor who works in those hospitals. Yeah. Well, the UN refuses to acknowledge Hamas as a terrorist organization. So no wonder somebody who works for the UN is gonna keep an Israeli hostage in their attic. Look, uh, when they say these are uninvolved, these are innocent, these Gazans are Hamas. They voted Hamas, they cheer yeah. for Hamas, they assist Hamas. One of the abducted people was actually able to escape. Hmm. For four days, he walked in the streets of Gaza trying to find Israeli soldiers, maybe he can. The civilians captured him and handed him over to Hamas. Wow. To me, it, say, it says everything. I mean, they, 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 and so right now we have to deal with a satanic, it is diabolic satanic. organization that wants nothing but to destroy us and kill us. I remember being on the Temple Mount with you about 10 years ago, and Amir is fluent in English, Hebrew, German, and Arabic. And the little children, remember, I, I mean, you've seen it probably a million times, but for me, it was the first time seeing it. Little children were like on a field trip, walking around the Al-Aqsa Mosque area, and they were chanting something in Arabic, and I turned to you and I said, what are they saying? And they were saying, death to Israel. <coughs> little children were being taught to chant that on the Temple Mount, little, little Palestinian children. Yeah. So it's, it's embedded in them from a very young age to hate the Jews. More than that, uh, if you're following me on Telegram, how many of you do, by the way? Wow. How many of you don't?
Don't say it. I will not. <laughs> I actually posted a video from a few years ago when a Palestinian mom was in a hospital where her son went through a, a, an organ transplant, donated, the organ was donated by Israeli, by a Jew. And she was, you know, she said, well, you guys do weird things. I mean, you give us your organs. Mm. And then she was asked, so uh, would you send your son to be a martyr, a shaheed? She said, absolutely. She just had her son's life saved by a Jewish person who donated an organ. And by the way, those Hadid family, they are spreading, you know, some blood libels that Israelis are harvesting organs from Palestine. We're not harvesting any, we're giving them our organs. Wow. But, but forget about that. She said she would be honored if he would become a martyr. Thank you for saving my son's life so that he can kill you. Exactly. Yeah, wow. Well, we actually saved the life of the leader of Hamas. Yehya Sinwar, while he was in prison in Israel, had a cancerous tumor in his head. We bumped him above all patients in Israel. He went, he went through the uh, uh, you know, operation. We saved his life, healed him completely from cancer. And now look what he does. Wow. His life was saved in, by Israeli doctors in Israeli hospital while he was in prison for killing Israelis. And now he's denying access of the Red Cross to Israeli abductees. Some of them uh, have colitis, some cancer, another thing. They get no medications. Okay, I want us to be able to get into a little bit of Bible prophecy. Do you have some Bible prophecy questions that are coming in? Okay, we're going to have Austin come on up here, and he's going to take, um, feed us the questions. So again, at 703-844-9969, if you want to text in your questions. Um, you, you and I have talked about how this may or may not fit into Bible prophecy, what's happening. Some people say Psalm 83, but... Psalm 83, that was really fulfilled in 1948, Absolutely. like when, when Israel became a state. So that's probably Psalm not Psalm 83 it. talks about Egypt, talks about uh, Jordan. It yeah. doesn't talk about Yemen. Yeah. And, and, and let's face it, this war is not against Arab countries. It's against one Persian country, Iran. Iran, Iran and its proxies. We're not yeah. fighting the Lebanese. We're not fighting the Egyptians. We're not fighting the Jordanians. We're not even fighting the Yemenites. It's the Houthis in Yemen that are shooting those rockets at mm -hmm. us. So it's not a war against countries. It's a war against one country and its proxies. Its proxies, Hezbollah in the north. Yes. You have Hamas there in the south, and then you have <clears throat> the Houthis coming from Yemen. Houthis in Yemen, and you have the uh, uh, several proxies in Iraq and in Syria. I mean, there's about 12 of them. You, don't, you won't remember their names, so I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> but, uh, all right, questions? Yeah, we've gotten in so many great questions. We're not gonna be able to hit all of them in the next 15, 20 minutes, but uh, let's talk some Bible prophecy. So obviously this conversation kind of makes us all curious. Where do you believe Bible prophecy fits into this conversation? Um, some people are just generally asking, where do you feel that we are on the prophetic timeline? Um, some are asking, um, and so just two questions, where do you feel, Amir, we are on the prophetic timeline? And then do you believe that the church will see the wars that Ezekiel 38 and 39 describes, or do you think the church will be raptured? Mm. Well, it depends if you come on Wednesday next week. I mean, <laughs> you, you might we're think not that here. we are think, not uh, here. Yeah, you've been raptured. <laughs> you've been left behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, first of all, I believe, and I've, we've, we've been talking about that for quite a few uh, uh, months or years even, that I believe that the, the biggest thing that is around the corner is the, the, the fall of Damascus and the Ezekiel war that will include Russia and Turkey, Iran, Libya and Sudan. And these are the countries that are basically turn against Israel knowing that no one is coming to help Israel. Mm -hmm. which, which is why this war cannot fit because we have three aircraft carriers, strike groups, 
B2 and other things all around us here, this is not this war, okay? At least not now. But, no. But if, if there's enough international pressure and our administration says, we're backing away, we're pulling it's a different our people, story. Then it becomes a different story. Absolutely. Right. Um, America is not in Bible prophecy. Right. However, America is used by God to fulfill Bible prophecy mm -hmm. when it comes to the uh, survival of Israel since 1948. However, in the next war that we talk about as the Ezekiel War, the war of Gog from the land of Magog, that war is very specifically saying that apart from protests of some countries against the war, no one is gonna help us. Mm -hmm. And that will be God Almighty fighting for us, winning for us, and not in ways of military, uh, regular military victory. It's gonna be supernatural yep. by the Almighty on the mountains of Israel, yep. destroying the enemies of Israel. These are things that are going to happen. Yeah, but right. for that, we need to have no allies to come to help us, and we need to have a country that is dwelling without fence, without border, without uh, walls, yeah. a country that is safe, secure, and prosperous. Mm -hmm. Which means, to me, this war we have to win. We have to overcome, we have to destroy, we have to get to the point where we feel that we, there's no more need for those fences, there's no walls, and we live in security, in yeah. safety, and in prosperity. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really curious to really get both of your takes on this question, because um, someone texted in this question, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, Dad, outside of you addressing all of the issues going on in the Middle East with your message that you gave a few weeks ago, um, Hamas and the End Times, um, you know, I can name a few other pastors who are really speaking into this issue, Pastor Jack Hibbs on the West Coast. Uh, but some people are curious, why do you believe that generally speaking, not a lot of churches in the West are talking about this? Because standing for Israel costs. Yeah. It will always cost. Mm -hmm. There is no way where you can stand on the promises of God and the truth of God, the values of God, the blessings of God, and you will not be hated by the world. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the epitome of so many churches around the world is that they are fearing men than, more than God. Yeah. And so they don't want to appear political. There's nothing political about standing with Israel, by the way, nothing. Right. Right. We're not asking you to support a political party in Israel. We're not asking you to support a specific policy of Israel. We're asking you to support the right of Israel over the land that God gave them. That's right. That's something that shouldn't even cause you to be, yeah. you know. And, and unfortunately, too many churches in, in, in nowadays are becoming sensational. And they yeah. want to believe not only the lie, but also conspiracy theories and other things. And. Um, Honestly, this is the wrong way to go. Yeah. Very few churches teach the truth and stand on the truth. And again, every time you do that, it will cost you. And there's another reason too, Amir, and I know that you know this too because you travel the world. It's the problem of replacement theology. Absolutely. So replacement theology is basically the idea that God's promises to Israel are no longer relevant because the church has replaced any promises intended for Israel and that the church is the true Israel. And I can't tell you how many people commented that on the YouTube uh, teaching that I did on Israel Hamas saying, well, you know, you don't know what you're talking about because Israel's not relevant anymore because the church has replaced Israel. That is just a, a false teaching. That it's it, not kosher. It's, well, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not kosher. <laughs> Uh, it's not even goyim. It's not even a Gentile thing that we should be believing because it's not, it's not scriptural. 
God's not done with Israel. He's not done with the Jewish people. And for us as Christians to think, well, the church has replaced the Jewish people and God's promise to do. So that's another reason why pastors don't want to touch it because they think, well, we're it now. We're the fulfillment of God. Martin Luther believed that. Yeah. Martin Luther was into replacement theology. So it goes way back. This isn't anything new that unfortunately a lot of Protestants especially have believed and it's just an erroneous teaching. So that's another reason why they don't want to talk about Israel because they think Israel's irrelevant. Like, and, and there's this uh, very uh, dispar disparaging view of Israel too because Israel by and large is a secular nation. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to know how much this, I remember after 9-11, churches were pretty full because people started running back mm -hmm. to God and are you seeing that happening in Absolutely. Israel? I'm seeing few things in regards to Jews in general and to Israelis in, per in particular. First of all, you're going to be surprised how many Jews in America are now rethinking their liberal standpoint. Yeah. A lot of them understand yeah. right now. A lot of them understand right now that being progressive and liberal is not going to help them because they hate them for being Jews. Not, I mean, all their friends in the establishment, in the academia, in the media, in the entertainment, all of their friends are abandoning them. Why? Because they're Jews. It's, and, and for the first time, whatever Israel does in Gaza gives them the right to hate Jews in general. They used to be very sneaky and, and say, well, we love the Jews, but we hate what Israel does. No more. Now they yeah. just say, they hate all the, all. That, yeah. that's it. The, yeah. Those days are over. So I see, and we're already, we're preparing. Israel is preparing for a mass return of Jews mm -hmm. back to the land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, we already see that happening. And, and uh, it, let me make it very clear. A Jew in America is different than a Gentile in America. Why? A Gentile in America is stuck in America. That's your country, am I right? If someone invades into America, that's it, it's your A Jew, everywhere around the world, has an option. Yeah. He can move to the only country of the Jews and automatically become a citizen overnight. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of them realize right now, now we understand why Jews needed the country. Now forget about the fact that this land was given to them by God and it's promised to them and the blessing comes with the land. Mm -hmm. you, you know, God promised and blessed Abraham when he brought him first to the land. Right. So that's the first thing. But in Israel we see now exodus from hedonism, materialism mm. and secularism. Mm towards belief in the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, the, at this point, it's running towards Judaism, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Judaism as a religion. Judaism that has some superstitious stuff that if you do this, if you say that. But it's a first step. You know, how can you believe in the one that God sent? How can you believe in what God did for you before you believe in God? <laughs> right. So right. it's a great move forward yeah. Yeah. to see them. They're running. And I'm telling you, the next thing that is going to happen is the enemy is going to be very, very angry that they're all mm -hmm. believing in, in, in God and all of that. So he's going to deceive them by sending them a false messiah. Right. And then they will, right. they will see a temple being built in Jerusalem. They will be, you know, mm -hmm. it's, well, that's it. And then they will understand that the great mistake three and a half years later when he will show his true face, put that abomination, desolation. The Antichrist. That's it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we see the Jewish people are not done. First of all, they're not done right. yet. But, for, but second, you see that there is this exodus towards Judaism. There will be a great deception in the future, sobering up halfway through the tribulation. And of course, the preservation of that remnant that God will save when he says all Israel will be saved. A right. third of, a third them, of yes. that remnant, yeah. Now, Amir, speak to the youth and young adults who might be here in attendance. So I, I have the privilege of overseeing our young adult ministry. The, the next generation, um, to their credit, they're a compassionate generation. They look out for the poor and the needy and those they feel are ostracized. 
Um, but they're also easily deceived into hopping on to the latest trend of whatever the media propagates. Um, and so someone asks this, uh, my teenager has a heart for anyone he feels are poor and needy. How do we communicate that we have a heart for all the innocent Palestinians? So first of all, there, there were innocent Israelis on uh, October 7th, mm -hmm. okay? It is the Palestinians that invaded and massacred us. That it didn't happen or, you know, just because. Second, you have to understand that the faster we get rid of Hamas, the better it is for those people that you call innocent Palestinians. Right. Because you have to get that terrible cancer out of there and give them other opportunities. Because right now, all they do is worship that beast and vote for it, love it, be inspired by it. As children, they already want to kill Jews. They are being you know, taught and fed with Jew hatred from, from birth, okay? Right. So, I mean, I'm not sure how innocent someone is when all he wants is to kill a Jew. I mean, we are talking about, we are releasing right now 13, 14 year old that stabbed Jews. I mean, they, they try to kill Jews, okay? But the thing is this, I want to encourage anyone that has compassion and heart, First of all, educate yourself. Yeah. Read and understand and find out who, where, what, and how. Because when you walk in the street and chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. You're basically chanting a genocide. Yes. You don't want a Jew to live between the Jordan River. And then you ask them, which river? Oh. Yeah, they don't know. Yeah. Which sea? Oh. Uh, yeah. And then they just, uh, intifada, inti what is intifada? Oh. We don't. I mean, yeah. they don't yeah. even know what yeah, they're don't. saying, what yeah. they're chanting. Yeah. So we, we need to encourage them to, instead of chant, learn. Educate themselves with yeah. facts, with figures. They'll find out, if they only learn, that there was never, ever, in the history of planet Earth, a Palestinian country, mm -hmm. never. So to say to free, what do you mean to free? You didn't have it to begin with. Yeah, yeah. So only if you really teach them. You know, what's, I don't know if you said this, I don't know where I heard this, you might have said this. It's the only people group that are named with a name that I they said, can't even, you said that, yes. they can't even pronounce in Arabic because Arabic doesn't have the letter P. So it's- Because the, they did not invent that They name. did not invent that name, right. It was, it was- The name is, the name was invented by the Romans. Hadrian. Based, yes, based on the history of the Jews. Yeah. The Philistines. Right. It has nothing to do with Palestinians. And just so you know, make, make it, I'll make it very clear. Arabs never called themselves Palestinians until 1948. They never did. You know who called themselves Palestinians? The Jews. The Jews, they have birth certificates. The Jews, Golda Meir yeah. was, she named herself Palestinian. The, the Palestine Post is the Jerusalem Post of today. We called ourselves Palestinians because that was the name of that region. And the first thing we did when we received independence is to bring back the original name, right. Israel. Right. Yeah. And that's when Psalm 83 was, you know, because the, what is it saying? Let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. Yes. The name was the problem. Yeah. All right, we got um, time for a couple more. Go couple ahead. more questions. Um, how do you see the whole conflict in Israel ending? I mean, it seems like an impossible situation. How do you negotiate with a terrorist organization? Do you see the potential for peace? Is it a two-state solution? Speak to how you see this conflict kind of panning out. Oi, don't give him heartburn. Oi, <laughs> oi vey. It's never a two-state solution, but. That's what I said in Congress today. I urged the senator that I met and the congressman that I met to stop this nonsense of two-state solution. It's not the solution, it's the problem. Yeah. There is no, because. I'm, <laughs> most people think that the two-state solution is Jewish state and Arab state. Am I right? That's what you think. No, that's not what they want. 
They want two-state solution, Arab and Arab and Jewish. They don't want two-state solution of Jews and Arab. They never wanted that. They don't want to call Israel a Jewish state. They refuse to do that. Mm -hmm. In 2018, 2019, the 45th president gave them a, a map of dividing the area, said, okay, you get your state, go ahead. Only you need to acknowledge that the other state is Jewish and that you can have yours as Arab. They refused. Mm. They refused because that's not what they want. See, people, we need to start listening to them. Mm -hmm. They don't want two-state solution. They've never won. All of their maps is one state yeah. from the river to the sea. Yeah. That's the state they want. They never wanted to say, this administration is somewhat interesting. But listen. What, the are, you, state, what, are, you, what are you really saying? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the State Department has been forever anti-Israel. I will, even in, I will even enlighten you. If it was up to the State Department, Israel would have never been recognized as a state in 1948. President Truman recognized Israel against the State Department. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not, so they don't like us there in that part of your government. Mm -hmm. And they view the whole conflict this way. Terrorism, is inspired by poverty and um, desperation or despair. No, this terrorism is led by vision and religion. Has nothing to do, you can give them work and you can give them prosperity, they will still wanna kill you because it's religious thing. Yeah. They call this whole war the storm of Al-Aqsa. Mm. Because it's the religious thing. Yeah. They don't want us to have any, any visits to the Temple Mount, although we don't even enter the, the mosques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. For that, they say they went all the way to kill that many people. It's one, a religious One more thing. question. Last question. Yeah. Um, That's Amir. It. What? I get, wow. Well, I mean, I we, time flies. I'm, all right. Yeah. Okay. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of us are asking how can we as the church um, best stand with Israel, support Israel, whether it's financially, um, do you recommend an organization we can financially donate to? How can we best stand with Israel and support Israel, practically but also spiritually as well? First of all, you need to pray f for the salvation of Israel. Yeah. Because true peace will only come when the Prince, Prince of, of peace, peace is going right. to come. Yeah, that's right. They'll never have peace. Second, second, I will say that you need, to, uh, you need to show them, because right now we think the whole world hates us. I mean, that's what we see on television all day long. Find a way to express your love and support, whether it's by writing or by telling them or by you know, just posting something, whatever. Don't be afraid, do that, take a stand. Now, I cannot sit here and give you, um, you know, organizations to, to donate to because, you know, I, I, I think that you're grown-ups and you can find yourself what is the best way to help the people that are in real need and, um, and just do that, mm -hmm. just do that. I mean, there's a lot. There's those that were displaced. They don't have homes. I mean, hundreds of houses are gone. Yeah. Uh, there are those that don't have work because, for example, tourism is, there's nothing right now. There is, um, um, and, and of course, there's uh, the affected people from, for example, a, a friend of my children coming from a believing family. He was uh, badly wounded. Both his legs were amputated uh, above the knees, and uh, he was a special forces guy. And so I posted a link 
uh, how we can help for the, for the recovery and uh, process and and people donated mm -hmm. stuff like that. I mean, on Telegram, almost every other week, I post a link to a specific place for a specific need. Okay, but, tell everybody yeah. how they can follow you. You're on Telegram. Uh, do we have a slide for all of your social media stuff? Um, I don't know if we do. Uh, okay, um, so you know we have uh, Telegram is the, the channel you where go. you can get all my news. You have to understand. By the way, you can scan it right now on your phone and, and, and join. You have to understand something. The news that I post cannot be posted on Facebook. Yeah. They always block me because there's the algorithm yeah. is going nuts. Yeah. So you have to understand, Telegram is the only way where I can give unfiltered, unbiased news 24 seven. Okay, mm -hmm. and by reading the time of when I post, you know if I slept or not. The <laughs> second thing is you can uh, get, if you don't like every day, you can register, you can sign up for our weekly newsletter. Once a week, we pile up all the news and we send it to you as an email. Our website, beholdisrael.org. And, and the last thing I would say is Hamas will not determine the future of Israel. Yeah. God. God, listen, God already determined the future yeah, of Israel. Yeah. And I just completed writing a book that will come out in a few months. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Discovering Daniel. It's a book just like the one I did on Re Re Revelation. Now it's Discovering Daniel. It will help me if you pre-ordered it right now because wow. I fight with Amazon right now because there are some elements that are suppressing the book there. So, so this is the new book, Discovering Daniel, yes, and exactly. you can pre-order now if you scan it, that QR it'll code. Help me if you pre-order it now, yeah. so it will go back up in the list. Have yeah. you ever thought about Truth Social? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't know that. Uh, <laughs> That's, That's fantastic. Is it? No, I don't know. I, I'm not on it. I just isn't that no, isn't that Trump's I'm not there. Uh, platform? I'm on, we're, so we're I mean, on YouTube. You, you probably wouldn't be canceled. There is my only point. There. Yeah, but I want to talk. Think about to, it. Pray about it. I don't want to preach to the choir. You understand? I don't want to preach to the choir. I want. Yeah. I want the messages to go out to anyone. Who, who, I mean, who has Telegram, though? Do you guys have Telegram? Okay, yeah, many of, of you course. do. Okay, all right. But we have YouTube, we have uh, Instagram, we have uh, Twitter, uh, X, whatever you call yeah. it. And, X, uh, yeah. and that's it. And there you can follow them on Instagram. Yeah. There you go. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, Amir, it's been great having you here, brother. I, I'd like you to close in prayer, yes. and then I want to pray for you, too. So yeah. why don't you close yes. in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for a great opportunity to gather around your word and to know that there is really no hope for any peace anywhere around the world mm -hmm. without knowing personally the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray that they will find you. Yes, Lord. We pray that by looking at you, that veil will be taken away. Yes, Lord. We pray that as many will come to know you as Lord and Savior before the great deception that will begin the tribulation that is the hardest portion in the history of Israel. Yes. Father, we also pray that uh, you will give wisdom to the leadership, that you will give us strength to, to, to go through this very tough uh, time, uh, boldness, courage, and uh, perseverance, and unity. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, you will also give Christians around the world uh, the courage to stand for Israel and by doing so also explain the things of God, the promises of God, the heart of God, and that if God is <laughs> no longer standing with Israel, what, how can we have any security that he will not forget about us? In fact, his standing with Israel is the greatest insurance policy for every believer that he stands on his promises. So Father, we thank you, we bless you, bless your nation, bless your people, bless your land. We also pray that you will bring an end to this satanic, diabolic yes. organization called Hamas and save the Palestinian people from yes. this thing. Yes. So they will also cry out to you, turn to you mm -hmm. and get saved because even for them, the only hope 
is to turn to you mm -hmm. and to understand their need for a savior. Yes, we Lord. thank you and we bless you. We thank mm -hmm. you for this church. We thank you for the boldness that Pastor Gary has uh, and for the leadership and for everyone that attends this church. We thank you again and we bless you in the name of the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua, we pray. Amen. And Father, I, I pray for Amir. I ask you, Lord, to bless him. You've opened many doors for him to share, to travel the world and to write books, Lord. And you've, you've been using him. And I just pray your strength for him. I pray your protection for him. Uh, some of the things he says, though truthful, is not always popular. And so, Lord, protect him and his family. Give him your rest and your peace as he travels and speaks and shares. And thank you, Lord, for his heart for you. Just pray that you would continue to open doors for him to help people understand the truth of, of who Jesus, Yeshua is. And again, Lord, I just echo his prayer for the Jewish people that they would come to know you in a personal way. And we pray Psalm 122 for the peace of Jerusalem. And we commit this to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Can you show Amir your appreciation one last Thank time? You very much.